This video is sponsored by Ground News. As I did last time, I'm not sticking to planes. Well, that's not entirely true, just bear with me. The key question we are trying to answer today is what is the impact of war and sanctions on Russian capability to sustain the war efforts? And since tanks and artillery shells have been done to death, let's talk about stuff that flies. In this video, I'm going to cover the general performance of the Russian economy and the state of the Russian military industrial complex. And after that, we will delve into more interesting stuff, that is, how sanctions are affecting the military production of aircraft, drones and missiles. And at the end, we will play the game of predicting the future because, well, we love risk. And I will tell the story of my life. No, Otis, you won't tell anything. This is a serious video. And at most you have enough time, not a life. This is very insensitive and authoritarian, sir. Otis, I thought we already had this discussion. I first started my research with the pure economics of Russia since the beginning of the operations in Ukraine and the consequent activation of further sanctions, because some sanctions were active since 2014. So Russia has halted the publication of various categories of data. However, they kept providing the standard set of data to the international organizations that report on world economic data, like the IMF, but there are many others. And mind, Russian data have always been considered very reliable by the analysts. And before some keyboard warrior jumps out saying that since they are Russian they cannot be true because the Russians always lie, I would remind everyone that these data have been used by analysts in universities and financial institutions all around the world for three decades with no issues. If there had been systematic and coherent data, they would have been noticed quite quickly. Anyhow, official data about the Russian economy are now considered of dubious reliability and some others are lacking. Therefore, I had to resort to other methodologies, chiefly the news outlets, trying to rebuild the picture from what is available. And here, I hit the wall. The same polarization that you see in the comment section of a YouTube video is actually present in the news outlets. There are two dimensions to it, the government affiliation and the political spectrum. So the problem is how to weight every single news source for its bias. And the solution is the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is an app and website that gathers all the world's media in one place so readers can compare coverage and see the full picture of what's being reported around the world. Uh, for example, in my case I have chosen Russia economy and here are the latest news with a handy recap of the main sources and the bias. For every story you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlets covering it, their political bias, how factual the source is, which entity owns the source and which countries are covering the story. For example, this dramatic piece of news from a Romanian website attracts attention, but I'm warned that the reliability is, well, less than excellent. Another example, if I want to dig into the latest EU sanctions package, I am presented with a vast choice of options with a level of classification, factuality and location. You can follow specific topics to keep up to date with breaking news uh, on a specific person, a location, a source or threats such for example sanctions or military or war and so on. And you can use it also to see the breaking news or your blind spot stories, that is, the stories that you are never presented because they are never narrated by the outlets that follow your own bias. I find particularly interesting the map feature to show what is being reported in specific locations. And by the way, I tend to use Ground News from the browser, but it is completely available on mobile devices with a specific app, uh, if you prefer. So with Ground News, you can become a smarter news consumer. You can gain a deeper understanding of the complexity and nuance of different issues by identifying media narratives. But you know me, what I appreciate the most is the help that I get in finding a common ground. Go to https ground news slash millennium to stay fully informed on breaking news, compare coverage and avoid media bias. Try it out or subscribe through my link for 30% off of the Vantage plan if you support the mission and find it as useful as I do. 
Don't wait too long because the discount is for a limited time. So... Please support those who support Mr. Millennium. Well said, Otis. Well said. So, after some time being lost in the research, I stumbled upon a video that pointed me to some interesting papers. But let's proceed with order. The official Russian gross domestic product, as reported by the IMF, which is based upon Rostat data, is as follows. A 2.2 growth in 2019, a minus 2.7 contraction in 2020, but this is easily explained with the unnamed global events in that year. A rebound of 5.6% growth in 2021, a contraction of minus 2.1% in 2022, the first years of war, and a 0.7% acquired growth as of April. So, what can we do to have an independent verification of these numbers? Well, uh, we are not in Russia and we haven't the same reach as Rostat. But we can use measurements that are correlated with the economy performance and infer said performance from those. One methodology is pollution measurement from space. This could be in principle tell us how much the industrial production, which is different from GDP. Yeah, thank you, Otis. It's different from the GDP. So how much the industrial production has changed? The result of this analysis seems to point us toward a reduction of minus 6.2% of the industrial production in 2022 against an official data of plus 1.2%. A piece of statistic that has been bouncing around in the Western media based on these estimates is a minus 16% for the Russian automotive industry, uh, presented by many as a fact. Um, don't get me wrong, the industry took a severe hit for sure, but the real numbers, we don't know. It could be even worse. And another sector that took a big hit was the civilian aviation, that today it is actually isolated from several Western destinations. Another study from researchers affiliated with the European Central Bank has considered a group of indicators that could be measured independently with no reliance on official Russian data. The study found that an estimated contraction of the GDP in 2022 between 2.3% and 5%. However, it has to be noted that this study focused on the civilian economy and the effect of military expenses is likely underestimated. Then there was the Bank of Finland who, that compared the declared growth to the various forecasts of the Russian economy and it found on average a contraction of about 9%. Other studies based on mathematical models of the Russian economy or on correlated measures like the oil price found a GDP drop on average of about 6 or 7%. So this is it. Here we have the numbers. In absence of certified data, we can say that the sanctions had a non-negligible effect on the Russian economy in 2022 of various percentage points. The forecasts for 2023, though, are quite different. It seems that the country has gone back to a moderate growth in the first month of 2023, albeit the FMI projections are not that optimistic. I have my reservations about FMI forecasts, but they don't do anything different from anyone else. And in this specific case, the forecasting model seems to be supported by a deterioration of the Russian current accounts which is caused mostly by the change in commodity prices. About 1 million of Russian citizens have left the country since the beginning of the war, and a consistent spike happened when the partial mobilization was declared. A consistent fraction of the people abroad is represented by highly skilled workforce. These are people who can find a job in the West or entrepreneurs who can mobilize some capital. For example, Montenegro has benefited of such influx of Russian high-value immigration. It may be expected that this may cause a lack of qualified workforce in Russia and, to an extent, this has indeed happened. However, the people in Montenegro or in Western Europe are still a minority. Most of the expats are in the ex-Soviet countries. For example, Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, has received an influx of over 100,000 young Russians. If this is the case, then an obvious question arises. These people are not outside Russia's reach. Why is there no effort to go and get them? Why isn't there at least some diplomatic noise? I believe there are two main reasons. 
The first is that those who have left are also potential political opponents. In this way, they are out of action and they won't vote at the next elections. They put themselves outside the political process. The second is that this is the 21st century. These people are not cut off from Russia. For example, there are cases of people who have moved abroad who are still working remotely for Russian companies. These companies have allowed these people to keep their jobs and work from home. This small exodus of the Russian people, though, has produced a tangible effect on the economy. Unemployment is at an all-time low, being around 3.3%. Surely part of this is due to the mobilization, the quite large number of volunteers who topped up the mobics, and the drain of men that is happening because of the expansion of the armed forces. If we add the people abroad, it is about 1.5 to 2 million people who left the Russian labor market. So no economy could remain unscathed by that. There are reports of firms, particularly the firms that have expanded with the war, that show how recruiting skilled labor is more and more difficult. And this prompts another question. How long before Russia becomes attractive for skilled immigration? Now, thanks to the pivot to East strategy, where China and India have become the first markets for Russian commodities, Russia is accumulating renminbis and rupees. Um, yes, because the transactions with these two countries are increasingly settled in local currencies and not in dollars. This probably means that there is no lack of money to import skilled workforce from India and eventually, to a lesser extent, from China. Sure, it may be a problem for the military industry, but everything else, well, it's perfectly viable. It's continuously happening in the West. And please consider that India has been for a long time a reservoir of skilled labor for the West, so the entire logistical and cultural infrastructure required is already in place. And there's another country that could provide skilled workforce, that is South Africa, which currently is undergoing a phase of political instability, so it is not impossible that part of the immigration will be directed to Russia. There has been already a precedent, some immigration of white farmers from South Africa to Russia in the past, so probably the road is already opened. But the people who went abroad are overall a minority. They are depicted as the best part of the country in several Western narrations, and, and to some extent they are. But what about all the others? What are they thinking? What are their intentions? So. Putin's popularity is in crisis, but it was even before the war, just after the latest round of presidential elections that saw Putin's consent rise after the mediocre result of the previous elections, uh, the Russian government got caught in an austerity period, like Picasso in a blue period, and announced rises to the retirement age. There were public protests throughout Russia that led to a mitigation of the rules, but the reform was approved anyway. At the election of the Duma, Putin's party actually lost some consent, and it is believed it was due to this critical bill that was penalizing the younger generations. I'm telling you this because one of the reasons why wars end is the increasing hardship imposed to the population, which reduces the consent around the waging of the war. Well, it seems that the Russian government is well aware of the problem. In the latest annual speech about the state of the Russian Federation, Putin announced important measures to care for veterans, their families, and the families that had a loss. He also announced measures to support families with children and raise minimum wages. I can't help thinking this is a carefully balanced policy to maintain consent by alleviating people's suffering. I don't think for a second that this is happening for kindness of heart, but because this is instrumental to the political management of the crisis. One thing well known to the economists is the phenomenon of substitutions. When imports become unavailable, either for excessive price or because of an exogenous event like the sanctions, the demand is still there. This means that substitutions happen, either from the internal market or from other more accessible foreign markets. Which is exactly what happened in Russia. In this crisis, after the beginning of the war, China has stepped in to provide the high and low rotation products required for the civilian life. 
but also technology and industrial machinery to keep the economy going. However, it wasn't just the Chinese who stepped in. Many Western brands went out of the door, but re-entered from the window, mainly striking agreements with local resellers or creating new ones that still sell in Russia. This is not a new phenomenon, it already started with 2014 round of sanctions and it has accelerated today. Why, you may ask, is this happening despite the sanctions? Well, markets are not moral. There is business to do in Russia and they just do it. As a matter of fact, there is no shortage of any good in Russia. The prices of some categories are higher than in the West, but you can still get an iPhone in St. Petersburg. No problem, comrade. Okay, 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 if this happened in the civilian market, you may ask, this is surely not true for the military industry. Well, sort of. We will get to that in a minute. For the moment, it is enough to say that Russia didn't really need much replacement in the military industry, save for one critical category, and they still manage with some difficulties to address it. So, Overall, the sanctions are indeed having an effect on the Russian economy, and it is a non-negligible one. But to fight this war, well, it is irrelevant. Uh, okay, not exactly relevant, but okay, bear with me, okay, bear with me. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Well, I think we could say something very similar for Russia, with a difference. In Russia, there is no doubt that politics controls the complex. In the latest years of the Soviet Union, the military-industrial complex was the largest industry of the country. During the transition to market economy in the 90s, a time of incredible hardship imposed onto Russia, whose memory has really scarred a generation of Russians to a degree second only to World War II. So during this transition, I was saying, even the military industrial complex suffered greatly. This was a sort of lost decade where resources lacked, know-how disappeared, and technology research stagnated. The situation began to improve for the military industry in the early 2000s, where the modern configuration of the sector started to emerge. The Russian military industry employs from 2.5 to 3 million workers, and it is very pervasive in the Russian society. However, the largest fish in the pond is the state-owned giant Rostec, which in financial terms is almost 70% of the total industry turnover. It was created in 2007, merging under a single umbrella several hundred companies, many of them struggling with the purpose of preserving the know-how while improving the effectiveness and the financial sustainability. Today, Rostec comprises about 800 entities with about 400,000 employees, albeit these numbers are continuously varying due to the acceleration of the world production, as we will see in a minute. Rostec itself acts as a coordination and financial structure, while the actual production, the actual business, is organized within holding managing a cluster of companies focused on specific sub-industries. For example, to stay in an industry that is close to our hearts, the aircraft production in Russia is concentrated under the United Aircraft Corporation umbrella. Many of the house names of Soviet and Russian aeronautics are now merely commercial brands under UAC. Uh, Mikoyan, Suhoi, Tupolev, Yidushin, Yakovlev and the Irkut are now merged in a single entity that does basically everything. Russian helicopters, which is part of Rostec as well, is the combination of Mil and Kamov. United Engine Corporation is derived from the agglomeration of Klimov, Kuznetsov and Saturn, which in turn is derived from Lyulka. These are just the most famous among the aircraft nuts like I am, but there are others which are very little known in the West that are arguably even more important. CRET, for example, the concern of radio-electronic technologies, which includes Fazotron, the largest Russian producer of radars and avionics, or the Kazan Scientific and Research Technological Institute of Computer Engineering, which is sort of a Russian equivalent of the Bell Labs. Always part of Rostec is Russ Electronics, working in semiconductors, telecommunications and software. 
outside Rostec. Other examples are the Tactical Missiles Corporation, which is the house of most air-to-air -air and air-to-ground Russian missiles. Or Almazantei, which produces the Buk and the S-400 surface-to-air missiles. This is not even the beginning of an exhaustive list of the Russian defense industry that is somehow related with the aeronautical world. I just wanted to give you the sense of the scale of the Russian military industry. In Russia, it is not less important than in the USA, but with a fundamental difference. All the industries that we have mentioned are state-owned. Some will say that this is a recipe for sure failure, but I don't want to discuss this. It is mostly an ideological issue and it's not really interesting in this context. What I want to outline, though, is that this is not the old Soviet Union. The system existing in Russia is a mixed economy that is an economy where a large percentage of the GDP is intermediated by the state, which controls the natural monopolies and the strategic industries. It is the same, exactly the same economic model that existed in the European countries till the 80s, and it proved to be quite successful. And this is also at least part of the explanation of one of the questions that you see flying around a lot. Why Russia, with a GDP the size of Italy, is capable of maintaining such a large military industry and military force? Well, this is a badly framed question and often receives an incomplete answer. The usual answer is that the dollar equivalent amount is not an indicator because the unitary purchasing power in Russia is much higher. Which is the same thing as saying that prices are lower. So. Uh, thank you, Otis. And if we account for this asymmetry, the Russian economy is three or four times larger. This is not wrong, but it doesn't explain why the prices are lower. Well, for the military industry, one of the reasons is that these companies don't really have to turn a profit. At least they don't when they are selling to the Russian state. When they're selling abroad, it is different because the export sales can provide foreign currency that is required for imports. But for domestic sales, they just have to do the job. Sure, there are several issues in the Russian procurement process and it is not a secret that inefficiencies and corruption have caused serious damage in some cases. But this market structure allows, in times of war, to act quickly and in a coordinated manner. Moreover, in times of war, corruption and personal interest, when there are an obstacle to the state objective, are quickly dealt with, particularly in a country with a lot of windows on the top floors like Russia. But this is true in general, even in contexts where the architecture is different. I couldn't make a proper quantitative analysis on this, but the perception is that the investigations for corruption in the procurement process are on the rise. So in a way or another, the Russians are gearing up their economy for the war. It is once again very difficult to have the exact numbers for basically the same reason that some official economic data are not published or are not reliable. So we have to rely on anecdotal evidence and news fragments. For example, we know that NPO Novator, the manufacturer of Calibre missiles and others, has hired 600 new employees in April 2022. We also have news that helicopter manufacturing has grown two to three times and modernization has been accelerated, for example, introducing a new AESA radar on the Camel 52. Air-to-ground and cruise missile production has doubled. Drones like the Orlan and the Lancet have grown their production many times. The reports say up to 50 times, but that seems a bit of a stretch. However, there is no doubt that the acceleration is happening because we see many more of them on the battlefield. Several official declarations have now mentioned how factories work extended shifts and the entire military sector is in need of at least 15,000 qualified jobs. And if this is not enough, it seems that about 400 companies that didn't have anything to do with the military are now producing components or lower technology items. The industrial conversion to military production must be approached with caution in the modern world where the dual-use technologies are fewer and fewer, but it is definitely an indicator of an expansion anyway. All of this brings us naturally to another question. Is Russia really self-sufficient when it comes to military production? In the mainstream media, we keep hearing that Russia 
is not self-sufficient. We keep hearing how they do depend on Western components. There is truth in this, but it is very dangerous to generalize. First, we must not confuse the fact that a certain percentage of the market demand is covered through imports with the lack of the component or the technology. The fact that only 40% of the Russian ball bearings market is covered domestically is due more to commercial reasons rather than inability to manufacture enough ball bearings. What we know, because it has been repeated many times in official speeches and reports, is that the objective is 100% self-sufficiency. Do not confuse this with autarky. This just means that the Russia must have the technology and the capability of doing everything, but it doesn't mean that necessarily is going to do so. However, Russia indeed is self-sufficient in most technologies, particularly if we look at the military sector. Anything about materials, metallurgy, chemicals and engineering is produced in Russia. The quality is not always the same as some Western products, but there are areas where they really have nothing to learn from the West. They historically struggled with miniaturization, but they have the know-how and the expertise to produce modern systems. Yes, with one glaring, enormous, gigantic exception. Is it integrated circuits, sir? Yes, it is integrated circuits. These are the bread and butter of really anything modern. Digital microcontrollers, processors, memories, FPGAs are the essential components of all our modern machinery. Western microcircuits have been found in many Russian systems recovered in Ukraine. Uh, there is an excellent Rusi report going into great detail, and we will see a few examples later. And uh, there is this ongoing report of the Russians stripping chips out of dishwashers or microwave ovens to repurpose them for um, military production. This is an unbelievable cruelty, sir. I, I will explain later, Otis, don't worry. Okay, there's no risk. Okay? What about my friend, the microwave? No, not even our microwave. The TV set? No, not even our TV set. The oven? Nothing, Otis, nothing. The important thing to know, though, is that Russia produces integrated circuits domestically. There are five foundries active in Russia and at least one in Belarus. Micron is the main Russian manufacturer and about 25% of the Russian demand before the war was covered by domestic production. And a large fraction of the domestic production was indeed for military purposes. The Russian silicon industry has seen an acceleration like all the other industries since the beginning of the war. Initially, with the sanctions, they lost access to ultra-pure silicon and neon gas, but China quickly replaced these supplies. But Yes, because there is a big but. No pun intended. So, Russian production process is very old, almost obsolete. So, the level of sophistication of microcircuits depends on several features, but the best proxy for the performance is the length of the gate, uh, which is one of the components of the microscopic transistors that are built into the microcircuit. The smaller this measure is, the smaller the component is, and the faster it runs, but often the more difficult it is to make it military grade. So, modern civilian high-end applications like phones or computers use 5 to 12 nanometers chip. Uh, these are in generally not used for military field applications, uh, at least not now, um, because they are still difficult to be made rugged enough. But 20 nanometers components are pretty common in Western modern weapons. As a generalization, we can say that less sophisticated applications can use 65 or 90 nanometer chips. Now, Russian foundries can produce 350 or 500 nanometer circuit. There is an order of magnitude of difference, and yes, it is a very old process. In principle, it is possible to replace one smaller chip with several bigger, but there are obvious drawbacks in the aerospace industry. Weight and size are notoriously a problem. Power consumption grows. For example, the first generation of the GLONASS satellites, the Russian Global Positioning System, contained foreign components. And after the first round of sanction in 2014, they became unavailable, and the GLONASS K2 satellites that replaced them were almost twice as heavy as the 
the previous generation. Part of this was due to the increased power transmission capability, but part of it was because they contained only domestic micro components. So it works, uh, but you can see where the problem is. In April 2022, the Russian government has started a crash program to establish a 28 nanometer supply chain, which would be perfectly okay for military production. Problem is, in this industry, a crash program means 2030. Semiconductors are an excruciatingly complex and difficult field to build expertise and know-how. But they are essential for, well, basically everything, so there is no alternative. You have to walk the walk. Then there are the more modern Western components that made the news. Sanctions are aimed at cutting Russia off from any possible avenue of supply. Most of the sanctions' effectiveness was based on this assumption and the discovery of Western microchips in Russian systems only reinforced this idea. Before the war, we knew that the Russians were using Western components. We didn't know the extent. However, this is not as a big of a problem as it may seem. Russia, despite what you read in the newspapers, is not isolated. Through intermediaries in the BRICS countries, it still has access to Western components. There is almost no way of stopping the flow. For some of the most complex ones, for example FPGAs, it is very hard to use them without the manufacturer cooperation. There are workarounds, but they don't really work very well. But in any case, considering the reserves and these new great channels, Russia is not going to lose access to Western standard components anytime soon. Some will need to be replaced, but many will still be available for the foreseeable future. And in fact, these Western components are not the problem situation going on. But worse from the point of view of the Russians, obviously. Many of the Russian custom chips, the highest value components, found in military system use a 65 nanometer node. Yes, designed in Russia, but it was not produced in Russia. It was produced in Taiwan, and now the access to this production is lost. These were custom chips. This is not something that can be found on the gray market. It needs to be produced. And obviously the Russians scrambled to find a solution for the replacement, and the Chinese built custom parts are starting to appear, but the results are less than optimal. We will see an example in a minute. It is very difficult to find reliable news on this subject, so here I am trying to make an educated speculation. There are indeed a few reports of the components being used in some of the missiles and drones changing, that is being different from the first units recovered at the beginning of the war. There is a very interesting anonymous whistleblower working in the helicopter industry reporting how the reliability of the Chinese components is much inferior to the previous production so much more testing and tuning is necessary. So this is probably something you can live with during wartime, uh, but it's definitely, definitely not ideal. What I suspect is happening in Russia is a desperate race to redesign the systems already in production to make them less dependent from imports. And the risk of doing so in a rush is to reduce, well, if not the reliability, at least some of the capabilities. Actually, Russian officials said in various occasions that it, the problem of the dependency has been solved. And actually, this may be technically true. Uh, what remains to be seen is how it has been resolved and how satisfactory is the replacement? Now that we have an ample background of what is happening in the Russian economy and in the military industry, what is the actual effect on the specific systems? I think that the first notable element is that Russia is still capable of working on the big research programs that were ongoing at the beginning of the war. The Zircon hypersonic missile is having teething problems, which is sort of normal, but the program is moving forward. The initial production batch is ongoing by NPO Machine Ostrogenia, sorry, but as usual, we don't know the quantities. At the end of 2022, the frigate Admiral Gorshkov has accepted the first batch of weapons. I always thought that the Zircon was going to replace the Calibre as a standard anti-ship weapon, but now I don't think so. In the only heavily retouched picture that we have, we don't see much, but it is clear that the missile is huge, it's probably going to remain a high-end weapon for high-paying targets, and the fleet will embark a mix of Calibre and Zircon for the foreseeable future. 
The Pakdia project, the Russian effort to build a very long-range stealth bomber by Tupolev, seems to be proceeding relatively unscathed from the sanctions. The aircraft keeps being mentioned in the news, three prototypes are being built, it is expected to start the ground testing in late 2023, the first flight is expected for 2025, and the serial production in 2027. This is quite a tight timeline for uh, every complex project, really. However, if the war effort keeps going as it seems, it is likely that additional resources will be pumped into the project to shorten the timeline a bit. The aircraft has been designed since the beginning with no foreign components, or at least with no difficult to procure components. So at least in principle, it should not be affected by the sanctions. The, the PACDA is a key project for the Russians because it is meant to be one of the projects that provide the kind of global reach and let them catch up with an aspect of the US power. So it is very important that they won't give it up very easily. Another flagship project still ongoing and in good health is the Su-75 Checkmate. The Su-75 is a single-engine medium stealth fighter aircraft currently being designed by UAC under the Suhoi brand. In March 2023, the usual patent was filed showing some discrepancies with the material we have seen so far. Some pictures have also emerged showing different configurations for the aircraft, particularly in the tail section. In a public statement from the head of Rostex at GA Kemenezov in May 2023, it was stated that the serial production of the Checkmate is planned to start in 2027. It seems a very tight deadline in the usual Russian style. However, in the case of the Su-75, we have to consider two elements. One, the aircraft that was shown in 2021 was not a mock-up, but it was already the prototype for ground tests. Two, it is official that the Su-75 avionics systems will be a variant of the Su-57s. Um, this means that the project could be probably more advanced than some analysts are expecting. We have no news of a flight yet, and that will be the actual test of the project progression. And since we mentioned the Su-57, there are interesting news about the Su-57 too. So the Su-57 is the Russian top-of-the-line heavy multi-role combat aircraft. In the past, the Russians have never been explicit about the dependency of the aircraft from Western components. It was believed among some analysts that a good portion of the delays that affected the program was due to the attempt of obviating the effect of 2014 sanctions. That is replaced at least the major Western components. In a recent speech, Russian officials pointed out how in the past year there was a great increase of military production, but curiously, they didn't mention the Su-57. I say this because the speech was exactly about how the shortage of Western components is being addressed. Take this as you like. However, a prototype of the so-called Su-57M has flown in October 2022, and the upgrade seems to be mostly avionics related. This might suggest that some components were still in need of replacement. Or maybe not, and it was just an in actual improvement, we don't really know. However, it seems actually to be the case that the main reason for the slow initial production rate was indeed the engine. And in fact, recently we have learned that this Delia 30 as such is basically ready, but they have decided to move to a B-dimensional nozzle from the current three-dimensional. This in itself, from a technological point of view, is very, very surprising, but this is for another video. The Tu-160 is a supersonic long-range strategic bomber designed to deliver cruise missiles, and I have a soft spot for it. I think it is one of the most beautiful aircraft ever created. However, this is totally irrelevant for its mission. The aircraft is the high-end component of the Russian bomber fleet, and its mission is to travel to a launching spot and fire its weapons at long distance. If the launching spot is dangerous, the aircraft can sprint at Mach 2 to reduce the exposure to air defenses uh, and to threat. The Russians keep this capability in such a high regard that in 2018 they decided to resume the production while the existing fleet is being modernized. This is one of the few cases where we have some numbers. In 2022, two modernized bombers have been delivered by UAC. In 2023, the plan is to deliver two new aircraft and two modernized ones. Anything the production is accelerated. This seems to be another of those cases where there is no direct dependency from foreign components and the program can proceed. 
The Su-35 is the most modern four-generation combat aircraft in service in the VKS. It is the latest incarnation of the flanker family. During the service in Ukraine, it has displayed good capabilities in the air superiority role, but it was way less successful as a suppressor or a destroyer of air defenses. This aircraft is essential for the VKS because till when the Su-57 or the Su-75 won't become commonplace, it will be the cornerstone of the Russian defensive air combat posture. It is essential that they remain operationally sufficient numbers. It is recent news that an entire new batch of new Su-35s has been delivered to the VKS. As usual, we don't know how many a batch is, but according to recent Russian customs, it should be either two or four aircraft. However, the key element here is that the production was not stopped and albeit slow is still ongoing for uh, two more batches. That's what we know. In fact, UAC has announced that a new Russian order has been placed, albeit we literally know no details about it. For a while, the Su-35s built but never delivered to Egypt remained available. Now they will be delivered to Iran. The likely reason why they were not acquired in Russian service is that they were export variants, meaning that same capabilities are curtailed, so they would probably have needed some heavy retrofit. In 22, UAC delivered a total of 27 new-built combat aircraft, 4 Su-30 SM-2s, 10 Su-34s M's, 7 Su-35S and 6 Su-57, which is a small number, barely enough to cover the losses. The picture that seems to emerge so is that production is going on, is continuing, but it can't pick up pace, probably for the compounding of all the issues we mentioned so far. The Su-24 is an old aircraft. It is in the same class as the Tornado and the F-111, but the Russians keep it in service till today in relatively large numbers. It is basically a bomber, but its variants are also one of the few dedicated reconnaissance and alien platforms available to the VKS. The Su-24 is in use in both the Russian and Ukrainian Air Force, but here we are focusing on Russia. And Russia seems to have about 50 to 100 units still in storage, and some of them are being refurbished for use in the so-called SMO. These are unconfirmed news, but it would make sense. It is more difficult to update, say, an old Su-27 to the Su-35 standard. It probably would not even be worth it. But bombers are more forgiving from this point of view. But obviously, this is the Great Drones War. So let's have a look at three of the most effective Russian systems that we have seen so far. The Lancet is a loitering munition. It is a category of drones that can fly for a certain time, find the target and attack it. The drone is produced by Zala in St. Petersburg, which is part of the Kalashnikov concern, which in turn is part of Rostec. The aerodynamic configuration is very interesting, but an analysis would bring us too far. What is important now is understanding the capabilities that are provided by such a system. With the Lancet, a small unit it can have in the air for a reasonable amount of time, half an hour, an hour, an instrument that can search and find its own targets and attack them. And if no target is found, the drone can be recovered. It turns out it is particularly efficient in finding vehicles and hitting them because it can attack moving targets. This is not a repurposed commercial drone as we have seen. This is not an improvisation. This is a proper military drone with encrypted communications and resistant to jamming. It has some level of autonomy, but the operator can manually fly it if is necessary, and in particular to attack the target in the final dive. It is feared by the Ukrainians because it is silent and difficult to spot till it's too late. Uh, the Russian seems to have received a large number of these weapons lately and in fact Zala declares to have increased the production 50 times. Which honestly it seems a bit too much. But definitely they built a new shiny factory just to build the Lancet. So yeah. There are various models with different range and different warheads and there are various types of warheads so the weapon is quite versatile. 
However, this is a weapon that makes heavy use of Western components. For example, a key component is the NVIDIA Jackson TX2 module. And if the name reminds you of a gaming GPU, it is because that's basically what it is. In fact, it is an embedded computer based on the Pascal architecture. It features 256 CUDA cores and 8 GB of RAM. Uh, for gaming today, it wouldn't be that great, but it is more than enough to be the brain of the drone. A component like this, this is basically a consumer component that can be bought online for a few hundred dollars. There is no way to curtail the supply through those great channels I was mentioning before. Um, these kind of civilian medium sophistication integrated systems will never become unavailable to Russia. The Orland 10 is a drone that looks like a big toy plane, but it is an essential weapon system for Russia. It is a drone with a classic configuration and a gimbal camera. It is used for reconnaissance and target designation by the Russian forces, and in particular by the Russian artillery. This apparently very simple system has allowed for very fast kill chain with the artillery and other Russian precision systems. There are actually two versions often used together. One version is a reconnaissance vehicle and a communication relay, and there is a slightly bigger variant with a laser designator for precision fire. It is used to identify Ukrainian moving targets and quickly react, directing guided munitions on them, like uh, the Krasnopol, for example, which seems to be available in large quantities. These small drones have proven to be difficult to detect and attack because they are small enough and fly high enough not to be easily visible from optical systems, and they have a very small radar cross-section, having well, relatively few metal parts. Some have been hit and the wrecks are covered, of course, but they turned out to be quite survivable. This is another of those systems whose production has been increased many times. In the original version of this drone, the only Russian component was the structure and the mechanical actuators. The engine and all the avionics was of Western or Japanese origin. The works recovered on the battlefield, though, have shown that components are changing. Uh, probably every production batch at this stage has differences from the previous. Uh, this is probably a case where the Russian domestic components are still not in use, but different Western components are adopted for the production. And considering the number of drones in use with the Russian forces, there seems to be no shortage of these parts. Giran 2 is the Russian name of the Iranian Shahid-136. This is a low-end, propeller-driven cruise missile which is now produced in Russia under Iranian license. It has an operational range of about 1,000 kilometers and a warhead between 30 and 50 kilograms. This system has replaced the more classic cruise weapons, whose production is lower, as the main munition used for in-depth attacks. Medium and heavy cruise missiles are now reserved for hardened target and used for surgical attacks. The Geran 2 is used in large numbers against lightly protected targets. It is not believed to have a swarming technology or automated deconfliction, but is still pretty effective. There is now a factory in Russia serially producing an improved variant of the drone. The Iranian variant uses imported civilian components for guidance, while the Russians have completely redesigned the system with domestic components, seemingly improving the precision. Uh, the, weapon is, the weapon itself is quite vulnerable even to all AAAs, but it is simple, cheap and easy to mass produce, and it is often used for saturation time on target attacks. So the story of these three drones is showing how the Russians have become very good system integrators, adapting to what is available as they go along, improving their systems and replacing foreign productions with domestic whenever they can. Another interesting subject would be the Russian missile production. At the beginning of the war, Kaliber, KH-55, KH-101, uh, Iskanders and so on have been used liberally, sur even surpassing 100 launches a day. Then the volume of fire has been progressively reduced and it has become a sort of a sport predicting that Russians would be out of missiles and predicting the Russian production. The subject is complex and it may be worth a separate video. For now, it is enough to notice that all the pre-war and early war estimates have turned out to be too low. Current Russian missile production is somewhere between 40 and 100 missiles a month of all types. 
which is not that many considering the volume of fire they would like, but it is pretty remarkable. And this seems to be another case where the push for an increased production, the push for a war economy has achieved some success. This has been a very long journey and what can we do with all this? What can we do with all we have learned? Because the key question now is what is going to happen? Is Russia going to be capable of sustaining the war effort? The first conclusion is that the Russian economy is nowhere near collapse. There are indeed difficulties, for sure, but there are alternatives and workarounds that are keeping the boat afloat. Substitutions kicked in very quickly from alternative markets and the Russians are showing a remarkable capability of finding alternative solutions. In the critical integrated circuits market, where substitution is not immediately possible, mitigations have been put in place and investments have been done to establish long-term independence. It is going to be a long and bumpy road in one of the most difficult technology sectors, but well, the wheel is there and yeah, improvements will happen at some point. Russia itself shows no signs of collapsing. Putin's government's support has been weakening in the last few years, but is still quite strong. Popular support is taken care of, it is not maintained with repression, albeit it exists, but with measures to alleviate the hardship caused by the war. Uh, the opposition in particular, the active opposition, is still a minority, it's either abroad, or it is not necessarily committed to a rapprochement with the West. This is something we didn't really cover, but yeah, it needs to be considered. The military production is growing and the Russian government has started a massive campaign of investments in the military industrial complex that seems to be producing results. The campaign is geared to have effects in the medium and long term so the Russian capability of waging war doesn't seem to be declining over time. Some of the accumulated capabilities are being spent but they are getting organized to replace them. Again, this won't be easy and smooth but the plans and intentions are in place. So, well, this is it. This is my assessment. You may agree or disagree, that's perfectly fine. I would love to hear your opinions in the comment below, but please be polite. So, I think I will end in the same way I ended one of the previous videos. I hope to wake up one day and the guns will be silent and I could go back to how does an AISA radar work videos that nobody watches. I think that one was a really interesting piece of content from a human perspective. Uh, thank you, artist. That was unusually kind and polite from you. I just installed an automatic update and my logic circuits are acting a bit strange, sir. I think I will roll back it. <sighs> thank you so much for still being here and for having given me your time. I consider this a privilege and a honor. And a big thank you goes to all the people who are supporting the channel financially by being members on Patreons or by one-off donations. You have no idea how grateful I am. And if you want to help the channel, you can do the usual YouTube stuff, like, subscribe, hit the bell. But something that would be really helpful would be watching another video straight after this one. There are more than 300 on the channels. Some examples will appear beside me. This is telling YouTube that this was a good video that is interesting. So it will be shown to more people. And this is it for this week. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.